Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. I, I think that this talk will dovetail nicely with the trust and AI talk, talks that we had yesterday in terms of thinking about uh, ML ops, uh, as well as thinking about assurance cases. If there's, if there's some kind of a risk that arises in machine learning applications, how do you mitigate that risk? Some of those risks are cyber, cyber security or other things. One risk is legal, moral, and ethical issues that deal with AI, and, and that's going to be the topic of what we have today for this presentation. So with the proliferation of AI over the last decade in particular, there's also been kind of in, in parallel to that a question about how do we responsibly use AI and machine learning techniques, and, and what, what even does that mean? So this is something that has been coming into the, the public dialogue quite a bit. Uh, as, as an example, the, uh, at Stanford, they have an organization that, that counts um, and media citations relating to uh, ML and AI articles that, that also link to uh, some aspect of ethics, be it responsible or privacy or fairness or wh whatever the, the buzzword happens to be at the time. And, and so that, that, uh, that tracker identified more than 3,000 uh, articles that, that came up in the popular news media within a given year. Uh, likewise, at the, the government level, uh, both this uh, uh, current administration and the previous administration uh, issued high-level high uh, programs. Uh, in the Trump administration, it was an executive order saying that we're going to have responsible AI, and kind of outlining what that entails. At the beginning of the Biden administration, there was the launch of the AI.gov website, which uh, includes in it this idea of what does responsible AI mean or kind of objectives for going into that. And so we have this kind of broad banner approach at the top saying that, that we want responsible AI, but then there's the, the next question of how do we actually get that? What does that mean? What, what, what are the different operational use cases that, that we have for that? So, so first off, just kind of a framework here for, for moving toward responsible or trustworthy machine learning and AI first, there's an education piece. What, what are the potential pitfalls that we have? And, and as was discussed uh, during some of the talks yesterday, that, that with machine learning, it's often not cut and dry where you just have edge cases that you can be aware of. That's more like a Swiss cheese analogy where the edges can be intermingled throughout the, uh, the parameter space and other things. So, so we want to have more of a, a first an idea of where can, we, where can we make mistakes? What are the problems? Next, we need to have an objective, an idea of what are we aiming for? What, what, what are the traits that we're going for here in terms of what makes good responsible machine learning? And then there's, there's the question of how do we evaluate whether or not we're, we're hitting the mark? And there are different ethical approaches that the whole branch of philosophy is, is based on trying to uh, analyze and categorize what it means to be ethical in a variety of different circumstances and ways, and there's not a single canonical way to look at problems. There are multiple different canonical ways. And so how do we learn from those? How do we incorporate those in, in, in terms of our decision-making process? And then uh, one, once we have an idea of where the pitfalls are, what our aims are, how to kind of look through different lenses for evaluating these, how do we actually implement these in practice? So, so that's kind of the, the framework for, for what I'll be briefly covering today. This is something where it's an overarching topic, so I'll just kind of be giving some high-level things right now. And when it comes to ethics, one of the things that is particularly salient is people. That, that, that we care about ethics when it relates especially to people. If it's, if it's some kind of a, a robotic machine that is just doing things with robotic machines, there, there may be ethical implications there. But when it comes to actual people, they're, they're a lot more prevalent. And so, uh, as Jay mentioned, that I, I work a lot with people problems, and so the examples that I'm going to use are going to be from the, the defense personal management sphere. And, and here you can be thinking of we're going to be using person level data. We have information, say, about a person's employment, a, a person's uh, traits and skills, education. It might even include some things such as family, which in the defense community where you're moving not just people around, but families around and you have deployments and other things, the family becomes a pertinent part of the, the equation. So, so it may not just be the employing question, but the elements of their community as well. When, when we're looking at the ethics here, at the end of the day, there's gonna be some kind of an action 
that the machine learning or uh, AI is pointing toward. And with that action, we need to kind of look backward and see what, what, what does that mean for these earlier steps? We, we have some data that we can include. We have algorithms. We have the specific type of analyses, but analyses to hear what's in the people sense. It might be group level analyses. You might be worried about group level shortfalls or surpluses in, in terms of your, your, your staffing profile. You might be worried about performance things at a group level, or you might be concerned about what's happening at the individual level. Is the individual a flight risk for going to uh, for, for leaving employment with you and going somewhere else? Is the individual performing well? Are you trying to get some performance metrics on the individual in particular? And, and, and based on whatever it is you're doing, either at the group level or the person level, you want to think about the action, work backward. And, and it's that connection between what the action is and all of the ingredients that are leading up into that action that, that really is where the, the ethics portion of it has the, uh, the big... Uh, the big emphasis, the big play. So what, what, what type of actions might we be thinking about here? There are a variety on, on the group level, you can think of some very arm's length actions that might be going on. So for instance, you might be interested in your staffing profile because that relates to training needs or other budgetary needs, and that you might have an algorithm that is, is perhaps built on individual person level characteristics but the action at the end of the day is this big group level action that is is perhaps that is separated from what these individuals are going to impact or are going to experience or impact. So they might indirectly be impacted by a big budgetary decision, but it's not a targeted decision. And so in that sense, the ethics of that decision are going to be different than say if I am going to take a group level action that is targeted toward a specific group, uh, that that group could be uh, something that is defined along one of the uh, protected classes, such as gender or race, et cetera, or it could be a group, uh, say in the military construct of things that pertain only to enlisted but not officers, or things that pertain to a particular occupation, but, but not another one. And when you have targeting groups, that is again, a, a different ethical uh, framework than if you're targeting say at arm's length. Um, on the person level, you have personal level assessments that you might be interested in. And for instance, there is in, let me find the quote right here, in DOD instruction 1320.14, uh, it permits promotion boards to consider, quote, automated computer summaries of information in an eligible officer's official military personnel record. Now, what goes into that is another question. But there's at least an idea that, that for some applications, there may be algorithms at play that are assessing individual characteristics for performance, uh, performance thresholds. Uh, much like you have your GPA in high school, there might be something a little bit more, uh, more, more complex around that, but, but something that's related to performance and assessments. Um, you could also think of actions related to a positive or negative screening. Maybe you get into a program. Maybe you're being selected for a bonus or for a particular career opportunity. Maybe a, you are being negatively screened for something. Maybe you have something that's more akin to a, 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 to a minority report scenario where, where you, you have potentially indicators of something that is going to reference some bad behavior or some bad outcome, and we want to do something to mitigate that up front. So again, across the spectrum of actions, you can, you can think that there's going to be a variety of different uh, cases in which you want to, to be thinking about how to address the problem. But you need to start with that action, and that's going to inform everything else for the ethical analysis. So uh, let me just give a, a, a couple of examples here. So the so first uh, example is that you have an algorithm screening special forces applicants based on those who have served successfully over the last 20 years. Perhaps this is trying to see who, who you might recruit into special forces or who you might uh, invest in for additional training or, or uh, potentially uh, a further tenure in that position. But you need to be thinking about, okay, well, if we're doing this with an ML application, 
are there policies that have been in place that, that may impact the, the, the validity of this from either a legal or ethical standpoint? So in, in this case, until 2015, uh, women were banned from uh, combat arms positions, including special forces. And that even today, there, there have only been just a very small handful of women that have made it through the, the rigorous screening to get into these positions. So what, what, what does that mean if we're putting it into a machine learning construct? That if we're saying, okay, well, let's, let's take all the profiles of people who have done well within special forces and then start to predict who might do well within special forces. In that sense, women are, are essentially out of sample, that, that, that we haven't observed them, or at least not in sufficient numbers within this concept, a, a construct to be able to generate a, a, a good enough prediction for them. Or the, the, the algorithm might just categorically say, you look different from all the other people that we've seen, therefore we're just going to say that, that you have very low likelihood of being in here. Um, so, so there are you can think of legal implications for that in, in terms of, uh, of various equal opportunity things. You, you can also think of um, what, what are the biases within existing systems? That, that for instance, in, in special forces, perhaps because it's easy to measure that, that there is an over, a, a desire to overly use physical attributes, uh, physical fitness attributes as the criteria for screening. Maybe those are relevant for the mission. Maybe it's just sufficient to be physically fit and that, that meeting a particular time on a two month mile is, is, is perhaps less pertinent. But, but whatever the case, there, there may be cases where there might be biases within the current system for how selection is taking place. And, and this, this requires some, uh, some reflection in the sense of saying, is the machine learning approach doing any better or worse than what we're doing at present? And, and, and in some cases, it might be that, that the biases within the current system are ones that, that you need to address before you uh, start thinking about how to automate this in some way. Another example. Question. So how do you, if you go back to the other one and you're thinking about women and men and wanting to be in special forces, how do you mitigate that given the data that you have? You drop gender as one of the numbers, do you look at like, you know, speed of finishing a mile and make it a dumb variable? Is that or you didn't or what? I mean, what, are, what is the... So in that one, this is one that is far enough out of sample that I, I think in this case, you would probably want to do something outside the machine learning construct to say, what are the criteria that we'd be looking for for admitting women into, uh, into special forces? It, it just do kind of a, but before we jump to the algorithm, take a step back and say, what, what are the initial criteria that we're going with? And, and if it were a case that say women were more, uh, uh, had already been integrated into the special forces community more, and we were saying, okay, well, are we concerned about having even more women become involved in the special forces community? And is that that gender variable something that we need to be concerned with? That that's something that is is tricky to deal with because you can't necessarily just drop the gender variable from your analysis and say, magic, we have a gender neutral model because a, a gender is related to a ton of other things. There's, there's a, a vast amount of culture that goes into how humans behave. And so, so just dropping that one variable, that uh, the, the fact that you're either a, a man or a woman, that's gonna be reflected in a lot of other characteristics that are within the data. So that, that's something that, that they, it takes, again, a lot of care and reflection in order to do that. I think, I think it's worth noting too, uh, like Cynthia's work, uh, she invented differential privacy, uh, but she's done like a lot of work uh, actually looking at theoretical definitions of fairness in basically applying it to models like this. Um, and, and yeah, like well, one of the things that she that she would she always says is that like, yeah, just removing like gender as a variable totally isn't going to work, but there are like more advanced methods that can be used, like once you create a model to assess whether or not it's actually fair. And, and, and with those, there's also the question of how do they square with, with legal norms? Because if you are, uh, uh, some of those uh, fairness model mitigation of processes algorithms are based on the fact, uh, based on the process of trying to, uh, to downweight people that have, uh, I'll, I'll take the, the gender example, perhaps downweight males and upweight females. 
or downweight members of one class and upweight members of another class. You need to be in turn able to square that with the, the tussle that the courts have had over multiple decades between how do you square the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause and, and being able to balance those is, is one that the, the, the courts have struggled with and, and that at least on the college admission side, there's, there's a question, I mean, uh, uh, quotas were outlawed um, uh, various things that are similar to that have, have likewise been. So, so there's, there's a, a difficult balance in terms of, at that point, squaring the algorithm with what you can do in a legal sense. Okay. Um, next example, that, that here, an algorithm synthesizes a service members' career information into scores that impact selection for future opportunities. On the legal side, you want to think about, okay, well, what are these opportunities and are the data even permissible to be considered for those opportunities? Uh, these can be privacy things, they could be uh, data use agreement things, they, they, they could be things to uh, a, a various a, a case law that, that dictates what things you may or may not be able to consider. And as we talked about earlier, it, it's tricky to think about if you need to not consider something just omitting it is not uh, not necessarily uh, just an easy way to go. So, so that that takes further reflection. Um, for the algorithm itself, I'll, I'll skip over this uh, because this was largely addressed in in some of the uh, the machine learning ops uh, things that were discussed in earlier uh, uh, sessions. But but you you want to follow good modeling practices throughout your process. So. Uh, so the last few slides were kind of highlighting what are some of the issues you might be encountering. We need to know what the pitfalls are, but on the flip side, we want to know what, what the goals are. And there are a lot of AI ethics guidelines out there. Tons of corporations have them, many governments have them. Uh, what are kind of the common traits that are emerging out of a lot of these AI ethics guidelines? And that there are a few things that seem to routinely come to the surface or are often mentioned within these guidelines, such as an idea of fairness and justice, transparency, interpretability, accountability, and privacy. And as uh, you'll, you'll uh, likely know, the DOD also has its own AI ethical framework for how it kind of squares these. Uh, of, for, for applications specific to the uh, Department of Defense. But then there's also thinking about, well, we have a lot of things that society is arguing that we want to have. Any one AI ethic guidelines, it's not gonna check all the boxes. It's not, it's not gonna get everything that we have. And so, uh, for instance, between the, the guidelines that come up in a lot of these AI ethical principles, there's, there's partial overlap between those and the DOD ones. And then you also have ones that are, are hard to deal with, like the DOD has the principle of responsible. And that you, you can think of this a, a, a couple of different ways. On a very positive side, you can think of responsible as being kind of a parent principle from which other principles follow, that, that we want to, to play nicely, we want to be good, we want to uh, be respectful, and that because of that, other things follow. On the flip side, you can look at responsible and say, well, it's kind of a catch-all. It's if if something if we say play nice and it's not one of the other things that we've specifically enumerated, it's it's necessarily under responsible. Like like in this case, well, is privacy under responsible because it's not under any one of the other ones. Um, in any case, it, it's one that is is quite broad. And so when you come to actually implementing something, you need something a little bit more concrete than that often in order to actually get to all the way implementation. And for implementation, there's also a challenge because different people, depending on what hat they have, approach the problem from a different perspective. And so on the organizational perspective, think of these AI guidelines that we've just been, been going over, that at the very high level, you say for our organization, we want there to be these principles, responsible, transparent, et cetera. But then that leaves it up to a, somebody to figure out what that actually means in practice. 
on the academic side, there, there's more of an approach of looking at things from the abstract, but, but, but less on the hands-on, how do I actually do this? And then you have the, the, the workers who are on the ground who say, I think we should do this, or I don't think we should do that. And, and that they have kind of the institutional knowledge, they, they have the know-how for, for kind of navigating what, what may be a, a appropriate or not, but, but they, uh, they may also lack some of either the, the rigor that the academics have, or that they also may lack the authority that kind of the high level institution has. And so, so being able to kind of bring all these different players together is, can be a challenge and is something that, uh, that, that, that needs to happen. On the ethical approaches side, there, there's a whole branch of philosophy here. And so I will just give a, a, a single slide to this and, and the, the, there's a lot more you can do, but uh, there's a few different ways that you can think about how to weigh uh, whether or not something is, is ethical. And the, uh, one, one framework is to, to weigh essentially the benefits versus the risks. And that if the, the benefits outweigh the risks, it is ethical. Uh, another way to approach it is, are, are we following exactly what has been written down in some kind of set of rules or laws or, or, or some kind of hierarchical uh, process that, that we need to follow? If we're following the rules, it's ethical in that sense. And then there's, there, thank you, five minutes. And then there's another approach of saying, is the person themselves, the one who's making the decisions, are they coming at it with with a good and honest heart, and are they are they ones that we would want to entrust this decision making with? And and so those are a, a few different lenses from which you can approach it. And, and often there's kind of a mixing of these approaches that we see in practice. Uh, so for instance, in the executive order uh, mentioned earlier, it has a, both the uh, both of these that are. are or make so one quote is when the benefits of doing so significantly outweigh the risk and the risk can be assessed and managed this is that that risk uh, assessment where if the risks are positive it's ethical but also we have in a manner consistent with the constitution and the applicable laws and policies so that's more the deontological approach where we we need to follow the rules and, and we, we see this often with ethical things whether there's a hybrid of a different academic approaches for uh, for determining whether something's ethical. Okay, so last, last couple of slides since we're just about out of time. How can we implement responsible machine learning and AI? At the organizational level, what can be, do, be done? Um, first, that the organization needs to articulate what, what it wants, not, not just in the sense of saying, we want to have transparency or replicability or responsibility or, or whatnot, those, those high level principles, but also some, some examples of what, what, what is our nightmare for, an or, for our organization? What do we absolutely not want to happen? What, what, are, what are things that would work out well? Um, being able to kind of paint perhaps by some examples or pictures, what it is that the organization expects, that that, that can give a, a kind of a mission, a guiding statement for, for the organization moving forward. It's also costly. As, as with any process that, that, that requires a, a certain amount of additional uh, rigor or scrutiny, if having responsible AI is something that if we just give lip service to, it's not going to happen. That there has to be investment in, in appropriate reviews or, or checks. Uh, and as, as bureau, uh, bureaucracies are, they're great about forming additional checks, less great about having those checks be, be agile and flexible and so forth. So, so in implementing things, we also want them to be, be more fle uh, flexible. There's also the question about, well, how are we actually gonna get this down to, to the worker bee level? Because if it's just a, a check the box ethics, if, if that's all that we're doing, it's likely not gonna stick. But if there's more of a teaching of what are the principles that we're after? What, what, what can we instill a desire to go after these good principles, that that's something that's likely going to be able to penetrate much more than just that, that check the box mentality. Two minutes, okay. Then on the worker level, there's, th th this is someone who understands the organizational framework. You need to be able to assess what, how are we doing things relative to the status quo? Or, or, or are we getting any better or worse on, on the ethical dimensions here? Are we, 
uh, are we even using the right tool for the right job? But sometimes ML and AI are just not the answer. And, and being able to, uh, to be involved in the development process throughout, uh, which was talked about previously in the ML ops, that, that with the ethical approach, that there's this beginning to end uh, need to involve the stakeholders, the, the, the people who are uh, aware of the organization and what, what are the expectations? What are we, we hoping to get out of this, this thing? What, what are the pitfalls for, uh, throughout the whole process? And with that, I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a, a couple minutes if you have any questions. Um, sure. Yeah, so I think when the government can control the model, it's easier for them to impose certain uh, checks to make sure that you're behaving in an ethical responsible manner, right? So a lot of times we allow third party contractors to come and look at our data and provide insights that can help guide those decisions. Mm -hmm. So, what should the government, or I guess, what does the government do, or maybe a better question, what should the government be doing? To make sure that these biases are accounted for in third party uh, analyses and reported out, and the decision makers know exactly what's going on with the models. Uh, that's a great question. The, the balance between proprietary on the one hand and transparency on the other is, is a, a, a challenging one. I, I think one way to get at that is, is if you have, for instance, a library of of kind of pre-adjudicated cases in mind that, that you're looking at. You're saying, here, here are some uh, edge cases for where we're concerned about ethical issues. And we, we have some concrete examples. And so the, the government has assessed these kind of ahead of time. And then they can say, okay, you, you run your algorithm. How well does it do, do on these particular set of edge cases that we have assessed? And then let's at least have kind of full disclosure of what what's happening with those that that may be one way to get at if, if it's truly proprietary and you cannot see into it at least being able to have some kind of systematic control of we, we know what these inputs are and what the output should be how do, how well did the outputs come out okay. Other questions? I got a question um so I know that we're very concerned about AI because it's of the possibility that it learns biases that currently exist in the system, right? And therefore perpetuates the same biases going forward. But it seems to me like that's the downside. And we don't talk a lot about upside of, well, the current system where people judge each other based on, you know, a promotion board or something else. And, you know, people are not entirely objective. Is there a possibility are we working towards AI being better essentially than the current system? Being more objective because you know people's judgments are subjective. We do have these biases built into the way we sort of do things. In some sense, it can be more more transparent and more objective. And by by framing the discussion on on the, the scrutiny so that we can see what what's going on, whether that's in terms of the transparency of saying, well, this is how the algorithm is making a choice versus just some decision makers make a choice, and we don't know. What, what the considerations are. It, at least this opens it up enough so that we can objectively see and assess what is going on in that process. And in that sense, it, it, it may be a, a framework for, for improving some of those ethical decisions. So, so that there, there is definitely that plus side on things as well. Alan, thank you. Great, thank you.